Let's pray with me. Father, we thank you for you. Thank you for the word. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for who you are. So as we engage scripture, open our hearts to hear, to receive, to be in tune. And most of all, let us apply um, what we're learning because it, it make it relevant for us, God, so we could see you in scripture and we can be who you would have us to be. So we thank you for what you're doing. You're wonderful, you're gracious, you are a mighty God. So I pray for a fresh anointing that I may be able to say with clarity um, what you would have us to say. So we give you praise. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Exodus chapter, I mean Genesis chapter 4. I'll be reading from the uh, New International, I'm sorry, the English Standard, Standard Version. Let me read this and then I'll give you a little bit of a background uh, to kind of bring you up to speed, and then we're going to go forth with the things that I want to share this morning. If you're in Genesis chapter 4, say amen. Good. It begins by saying this in the ESV. Now, Adam knew his wife Eve, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again she bore his brother Abel. Now, Abel was a keeper of the sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought forth to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his face fell. And the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, the Bible says, sin is crouching at the door. It desi its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. Amen. Now, let me pick up here. I want to, um, if we can put the big idea on the screen, I want to walk through that and just kind of lay some foundation to walk through it so we can all be on the same page. Here's what it says. Our approach to worship dictates both the quantity and the quality of our gift to God. Repeat after me. Say, my approach to worship dictates both the quantity and the quality of my gift to God. Oh, come on, let's do that together. One more time. Say, my approach to worship dictates both the quantity and the quality of my gift to God. I'm going to flesh that out, and this is why it's so important for you to have heard our last week's message to put that statement into context for you so we can, you can understand what we're sharing in the heart of what I believe God is teaching us in his word. The context, just to give you a little bit of a review and to move through to where God would have us to pick up this morning, it, it's a context of worship. And you all know in the book of Genesis chapter 1 leading up to verse chapter 4, we are at the beginning of time where God had just created man. He had placed them in the garden, uh, given them a job to do. Man sinned. Man fell out of the garden. And so as a result, he was displaced on the outside of the garden and had no access to the tree of life that resided within the garden. Of importance to the text that we talked about, this is a scenario where we see these two brothers coming before God in the phrase that I'm using with an attitude or an environment that calls for them to worship God. Now, what you need to know is that at the onset of this text, if you were to revert to chapter 1 all the way to where we are in chapter 4, there is no pointed instruction given to these two individuals to say, you need to do this, or you need to bring this gift, or you need to offer these things to God. What you see is two individuals of their own free will, their own volition, their own self, making a, a conscious effort to bring these offerings, or the term that I'm going to use in a little while, minha, to God. Now, what I like about the text is if we can put the first slide on the screen, is something I want you all to walk through with me by way of review, is that number one, I want you to hear with me that God deserves to be worshipped. Come and repeat out to me. Say, God deserves to be worshipped. Say it again. Say, God deserves to be worshipped. Amen. And while they're catching up with that, here's the two things about the area of worship with God so we can kind of get to where we need to are that's important. Because this is an important theme that I believe kind of just flows throughout the entirety of Scripture, particularly in this particular narrative that we're looking today. Worship entails two things. God fellowshipping with us and we fellowshipping with him. 
and God, are we engaged in God or God engaged in us in dialogue? The reason those two um, principles are important when it comes to the area of worship, if you understand the gravity of the situation that's surrounding the text in front of us, what you see, as I hinted, alluded to earlier, is that visualize with me, the Garden of Eden is over here, and at the onset or the beginning of time, God resided in this beautiful place called Eden, and Adam and Eve had direct access to God in Eden. Now, what you need to know about that is where the Bible says, in the cool of the day, God would come down and he would fellowship with them, and they in turn would fellowship with him. And what happened was man sinned, and God placed him now outside the confines of the garden, and then he places the cherub with a flaming sword to guard the entrance to the garden to prevent Adam and Eve from going to the tree of life and eating. Now, you would think, I said this last week, you would think being outside the garden, the relationship is so severed, the relationship is so broken that they don't have access to God. What I like about this particular text and what underpines the foundation of what I want to share with you God does not anticipate that they come to him, but notice what God does. He leaves where he is. Oh, my gosh. And he goes to where they are. Y'all, come on. Isn't that good news? And he engages them in fellowship. He engages them in conversation. He engages them in dialogue. And they're offered an opportunity to continue to worship him because of his desire for fellowship and his desire for dialogue. Now, this, this is free because I shared this last week and I want to move on. I find it exciting that it doesn't matter how much I blow it and how much I mess up and how bad I am, God has a habit of showing up where I am. Oh, come on, y'all. Say amen. That, that's good news. That's good news. He has a habit of showing up where I am to engage me because he wants the fellowship and he gives me an opportunity to make it right. Turn to neighbor and say, neighbor, come on, say, God will show up wherever you are. Because he loves you. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good news. He will do that. He will show up wherever you are because he loves you. And, and what's, what's, what's nice about God showing up where they are is the term I'm using is this worship environment is going on. And God shows up there. And if we can get the second thing on the screen is that he shows up because his approach to worship dictates the term I'm using is both the quantity and the quality of our gift to God. And I want to lock in to the issue of quality there as we talk through this. And go to the third one, because I want to hang my hat there for a little while as we walk through this. Here's what the third thing say. God's response to our worship now is based on our attitude when presenting our gifts to him. My attitude dictates God's response. Yeah, I want to walk with that. So look with me. Let's read. Let's read. Go to the Bible. Read with me um, verse 3, and let's walk through this because I want to pick this up and talk through it as we go through to where God is. And if you're in verse 3, say amen. amen. Verse 3 says, in the course of time, Cain brought, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and their fat portions. And my translation says, and the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. The issue that you're probably wondering is what does it mean when it says God had regard for one and not regard for the other? I don't know if the, the other slide has it on it. Can we go to the next one? I want to see if this definition is there no backup? That's not there. So here's what my definition of the word regard, and when we look at, do the work on it. The word regard simply means that God was pleased, God accepted, God had favor. And the term that I'm using is the fact that God paid attention to one offering, and he did not pay attention to the other. And the issue is what's that all about and what's, that, what's happening there. And the premise I want to lay as it relates to this term and the definition of this word, pay attention, that attitude dictates whether God pays attention or not. 
Okay? So, so lock, let, me, let me illustrate this with you. Here is Cain and Abel. And understand with me, when uh, we talked about this last week, that word minha simply means them bringing an offering, an offering up to a superior or to a, de- a deity as a way of them saying thank you to him. Are you with me? So it's unsolicited. It is not like God is saying, bring me this gift or bring me that. Of their own free will, they offer the gift to say, Lord, I thank you for your provision. I thank you for your sustenance. I thank you for what you're doing. I thank you for who you are. Now, this is free. Notice with me, there is no motive in their giving. Let me tell you what that means. Let me tell you what that means. There's no $100 lines. I said this last week, right? There is no sow a seed of faith. Come on, there's none of that going on. It's just, I'm bringing the gift to God. Why? Because, God, I love you, and I want to say thank you. Paramount, paramount, paramount. Because I'm going to say this. Today in Christendom, we've strayed so far away that we feel we need to manipulate people. Oh, come on, say, man. Don't act like you ain't never been and you didn't qualify for the $100 line, so you was waiting for the preacher to get to $5 so you can stand up. Come on. You know? <laughs> we, we've been there, done that. We've seen it. But, but please notice in this text, it's simply an expression of gratitude because of who God is. So look at how this looks. You got to see Cain. Here's Cain, and I, I illustrated this last week, but I want to do it again. He is picking from the fruit of his ground after God has graced him with the overflow from Eden. And it comes to where he is, and it waters his soil. And he gets that first fruit, and he takes it. But the problem is, he keeps it for himself. Then he continues to pick second and third. And then after he'd taken care of him, he brings the second, and he offers it to God. And he says, Lord, thank you. And the Bible says God did one of these. He didn't pay attention to his gift. Abel, on the other hand, he is sitting here and he's looking at a sheep. And his sheep gives birth. And the Bible is clear. The firstborn and the fat thereof, meaning that he took the best and the first fruit that he can have because he realized it wasn't about him. And he comes now And he offers it to God, and he says to him, thank you, just like his brother did. But look at the text. God pays attention to Cain and his offering, I mean, Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he paid no attention. He had no regard. What is going on in the text? Here's what I want you to see. The attitude in how they brought the gift made all the difference in the world. Listen to this. Listen to this. Cain comes, and I, we have young people here. Y'all might not be able to write this. Y'all know the song? I work hard for my money. Y'all know that? So hard for my money. Yeah. I work hard for my money, so you better treat. Y'all know that? Yeah. See, y'all just lost. Y'all don't know, y'all. Old folk, explain it to your kids, okay? They have no idea. They just know that crazy. <laughs> they know that kind of stuff. So so he takes it, he takes it, and he blesses himself first because he had fooled himself into thinking he was the provider. He dug the ground. He planted the seed. He did all the work. So the first person, if you will, to give gratitude to was himself. Abel, on the other hand, realized, I am not in control of this. I'm breathing God's air. God's air. I, I am working God's soil. God is the one who provides. God is the one who does what God does. It's all about God, and it has nothing to do with me. So notice what he does. The moment he gets the first fruit, as opposed to taking care of himself, the first thing he does is he takes it and he brings it to God, and he offers it to him and say to him, Lord, I thank you. And the Bible is clear. God pays attention because he realizes that Abel knew who he was. And Abel was returning thanks to him, whereas Cain was making the mistake of placing himself in a position that he ought not put himself in. Come on, does that make sense? 
So, so I want you to notice the differences in the attitudes of the individual. One had God in first place as provider. The other did not have God in first place as provider. So when you read the New Testament, it says in Hebrews, by faith, Abel offered a better sacrifice, right? Now, when you continue to read, you hear things like this in Scripture, that Cain's heart was evil, which caused him to do the things that he did, right? But one had a better attitude, and the other did not. Go to the next slide. I want to kind of walk through this, because it's very, very important for us to understand Attitude makes all the difference in how we worship God. Now, part of the tension in the text that might not be explicitly stated, stated that I want you all to get by way of application, and how we function today is this. Here's what we said on Wednesday. Understand with me that in the book of Genesis, specifically in chapter 3 and chapter 4, Adam and Eve, was, they were in the garden with God in Genesis chapter 2 and in chapter 3. Because they were so close to the situation, they had no problem recognizing God as provider. Come on, say amen. They, were, they fellowship with him. They walk with him. They spoke with him. They talk with him. They saw him as provider. So the fact that God placed them outside the garden, they were still close to the situation, and they knew it was nothing but the grace of God that had them outside the garden, but still reaping the benefits. I wish I had somebody in here. And because of where their position and how close they were to the situation, they knew and they had sense to know it had nothing to do with them and everything to do with God. So notice what they did. They brought and they offered thanks. And they taught their children to offer thanks because they said to them, God is provider. Something went wrong in Cain. Now here's what happens. Time progressed. Can we say that? And as time progress, and the longer we live, the further we get from Eden. Does this make sense? And the further I get from Eden, the more I forget that it's all about God, and the more it starts to look like me doing I wish I had a witness or two. Can we be honest this morning? Come on. And, and the, more, the more I walk away, and, and, and it's not so much walking away, but as time elapsed, and all of a sudden, here we are in 2018. That's a long way away from what happened in the Garden of Eden. And what happens now in 2018 is I wake up every morning. Come on, y'all. And I go to my job, and if I work for Kaiser, I fool myself into thinking that when paid comes, Kaiser is my provider. Come on, come on. And, and I'm quicker to give thanks to Kaiser for the job as opposed to giving job God the, 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 the wisdom and the power and the sovereignty and the ability for blessing me to even have a job. Oh, come on, talk to me. And the further I get away, the more I, I localize provision. So, for example, I finance my home and I thank the bank for providing a home. Come on, y'all. I finance my car, and I thank the finance company for providing my car. I have a cell phone, and I thank Verizon for providing me with data, and because I'm so far away, I forget to realize that it's God, come on, it, it, it's God who has provided all the resources, and he is the provider of providers. And so here's what we do. As time elapsed, we think it's about us. And so we want to bless us. And watch this. And we take care of the immediate provider and forget who the provider or providers really is. There used to be a time where your home was number one on your bills. But, but I think it's changed. It's cell phone. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Folk in church, cell phone. Doesn't matter where you are, right? And, and so here's what we do. Homeless, but they got a cell phone. Oh, don't act like you ain't ever seen that. Yeah, see them bums on the street. We'll work for food. Hang on, I got to make a call. 
You know? <laughs> it doesn't make sense to me, but we feel as if as long as I have data, I'm okay, right? And the problem is because we're so close to that thing and so far away from God, we fool ourselves into thinking the immediate provision needs to be provided. So look at what we do. We take care of the phone bill first. Oh, come on. Can we be honest? We take care of the car payment first. Come on, come on, come on, come on. We take care of the mortgage. We take care. And I'm not minimizing and saying those things are important because somebody's in here saying, well, I got to have data. I got to have this. I'm not debating all of that stuff. We take care of all of those things just like Brother Man Cain. We pick the best fruit and we keep it for ourselves. Then whatever is left, we want to bring it to God and God is like this. We're not getting his attention. He's not paying attention to what we're doing. Why? Because we have misplaced him in the line of providers. The closer they were to Eden, the easier it was. Right? So here's the thing I want to say. God deserves. Come on. He deserves to be. Oh, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, y'all. He deserves, come on, if you believe that, come on, say, God deserves to be first. Say it again, say, God deserves to be first. Because he created the earth and the fullness of it, the world, and everything that dwells within it, it belongs to God. So God deserves to be first, and we need to learn to keep him first and put him first in everything that we've done, right? So look at the text. Look at the text. Let me, and then I'll flesh this out. Notice what it says. Because God was not first, here's what it says here in, um, let me read with verse 4 again. Cable, Abel also brought up the first fruit of the flocks. And the fat portions, and the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face or his countenance fell. Okay? So notice this about the text. His countenance was not fallen when he brought the offering. It was after he brought the offering, and he went home, that he discovered the problem. Now, notice what I said to you, right? Don't, don't, don't so much read the text linearly to say that this happened, this happened. Allow some space, allow some time, allow some things to happen. So lock into this, lock into this. Here, let me illustrate it this way. I just love this illustration. Abel comes and he brings his offering. And he offers it to God. There's no dialogue between him and God. God is pleased. And he goes home and time elapses. And he goes back and he watches his sheep. And man, they're like popping out sheep. Yeah, you got to get this. It's like sheep everywhere, like... Dang, God, this is so cool. And every time a sheep comes out, notice what he does. He takes the firstborn and he comes back and he offers it to the Lord. And he says to him, what? Lord, thank you. Come on, does this make sense? And he goes back and he goes back and he's watching the sheep. And it's like pop, pop, pop. Just sheep just pop. They just come in out, pop, pop. He's like, dang, this is like so sweet. I mean, just herds and herds. But he keeps going back to God and he keeps offering God the first fruit. Lord, thank you. And he keeps, goes back. And, and all of a sudden, he's got sheep everywhere. Are oh, y'all missing this? If you read the biblical story, you see it all play. Cain, second, you gonna put something out? Nothing happens. It's almost as if the streams dried up, right? And he's like, what's up? And then he looks at Abel, man, you popping sheep left and right. He goes to his garden. I can't even get a dry pomegranate. So all of a sudden, his attitude steps in. What's up on that? I mean, come on, you work fine the first time. Why are you not working today? Doesn't that sound like some of us? So listen to God. Listen to God. Why is your face fallen? Or why are you angry? Why is your countenance down? Right? Let, let me help you all with this because you're like, that's them. That's not me. Came to church. It's all good. Praise the Lord, hallelujah, it's all good. Then you go home and the washing machine. <laughs> Come on, y'all. That worked fine this morning. All of a sudden, washing machine, gone. What's up on that? Try to cook you a piece of baked chicken. Oven. Don't act like it ain't never happened to you. <laughs> Falling apart. What in the world? 
You go in your car to go to Sears to see if you can get a loan to get another one, another provider. And, and all of a sudden, the car won't start. And then watch you. I don't know what's wrong with these raggedy things. And listen to God. Why has your countenance fallen? <laughs> no, let me, why are you tripping? <laughs> and here's, this is dialogue, right? And we're fine this morning, God. I don't know what's wrong. And then God shows up like we're going to see where he wants to be first. Well, if you do what's right, come on, is this making sense? Is this making sense, right? And, and, and we have these bad attitudes and all this stuff simply because we have misplaced where God is on the continuum and we need to learn how to redirect, right? So, so, so notice, notice the text. Let's walk through this. Go with me. Go with me. I want to put them first. Go with me to, what verse is that? Verse 6. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why has your face fallen? And then look at verse 7. If you do, what's the word? Well, then it says, will you not be accepted? And look at the other one. If you do not do well, sin is where? Crouching at your door. Let me read this last phrase and I'll talk about it. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. So look at verse 7 again. If you do well, will you not be accepted? And you have to agree with me that when Abel brought his offering, that first if clause applied to him. I don't know if we can put that. Okay, good. Here's what it says on the screen. If you do well, will you not be accepted? And look at what that word, um, the Greek, I mean the Hebrew associated with that word well means, right? Splendor, honor, formally or loftiness, the state of having a high status. I love forgiveness. Uh, I love lifting up. I love the removal of guilt with the focus on the acceptance. You see how these words work together? And relationship which accompanies the forgiveness. So here's what it says. If you do well, will you not be lifted up? Or if you do well, have I not promised you that I'm going to take care of you? In other words, here's what it sounds like in Matthew 6. If you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, come on, y'all, will not what? All things be what? Come on, say it with me. Add it unto you. There's a principle there where God is saying, if I am positioned where I need to be, you don't have to worry about anything. Oh, come on, somebody else say amen. Come on, y'all. Hey, come on. Here's what he's saying. If, if I am where I need to be, where I should be in your life, you don't have to worry about life because the earth is the Lord's and the fullness of it, the world and all who dwells therein. I own the cattle on a thousand hills. Come on, the sheep, the lamb, the goats. Everything belongs to me. So if I'm here, guess what I'm going to do with you? So, so Cain, you're sitting here looking at this ground and it hasn't doing nothing. Just, just put me where I belong, right? Go to the next slide. Watch this one. Watch what the next one says. But if you do not do well, sin is what? Before I deal with that definition, here's some historical cultural information that you need. In early Mesopotamia, it's around the time and what was going on around the time of Genesis. The Mesopotamians had this philosophy that every individual had these two, um, when you look at the, 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 the Hebrew word that has to do with lying or crouching at your door, um, some commentators trace that back to the Hebrew root that Mesopotamians translate to being demons, right? So here's what they would say. Every person had two demons. And they would say, you had a good demon, and the purpose of the good demon was to protect you or to make sure you're taken care of. Then they would say, the second demon, however, is to do evil to you and to do wrong to you. 
The first demon might have had your best interest. The second demon did not have your best interest. So when you look at, at the word that's used, the word rabbi that used, what the word says, it's lying in position. It's resting um, but ready for action denotes varying officials and also see the same demons, especially those that guard entrances to buildings. Okay? So here's what uh, God in, his, ter- in his, his, his dialogue says to, to Cain. This building, the, the demons are lying there. Or a sin is lying there. And here's what it says. If you do not do right, hear me out, you grant them access or you grant them entrance to wreak havoc in your life. Very, very important. Sin now is lying at your door. It's like that, like, like how's it said in the New Testament? The enemy's like a roaring lion. Y'all know this, come on. Going around seeking whom he may what? The, y'all know it, y'all know it. You know what it says, be strong in the word, all that good stuff. So here's what he's saying. He's waiting at your door. And what I love about the fact that he's waiting at your door, he's just waiting for an opportunity to come in. Now, what I like about the illustration is he ain't strong enough to come in by himself. Oh, y'all, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. He can't, he can't, he, all he can do is knock. But he's outside the door. The only way that he, he, excuse me, I don't, I'm all excited now. The, the only way, the only way, the only way that he has access is you've got to. Oh, yeah. and, and so, so here's, this is critical, this is critical, this is critical. Here's what God just said to Cain. Dude, the reason you pouting. The reason you fussing, the reason you're angry is not because sin is lying at your door, is you mess around, yeah, yeah, yeah. You messed around and opened it, and by virtue of the fact that you opened it, you gave him access, let me bring this back home, to break your refrigerator. Oh, he's tripping now. You gave him access to mess your marriage up. You gave him access to cause that addiction that you can't seem to get rid of. I wish I had somebody in here. You gave him access to all that stuff. It's because you open the door, and here's the thing, the depth of what the text is saying, because you open it, you by yourself is not strong enough to close it by yourself because he's stronger than you. Oh, preacher, where are you getting that? Let's look at the text. Let's look at the text. Look at the text. Look at the text. Look at the text. Notice what it says. Notice what it says. If you do well, will you not be accepted? If you do not do well, sin is what? Crouching at the door. Look at this. Its desire is for you, but you must do what? You must master it. You must rule over it, or you must conquer it, right? And, and, and I think, go, yeah, look at this. Its desire is contrary for you, but you must rule over it, okay? This word rule over is a very, very interesting term. Back up to Genesis chapter 3. Back up to Genesis chapter 3 and look with me at, um, look at verse 16. Look at verse 16. Let me know when you guys are there. If you're there, say amen. Watch what it said. To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you will bring forth children. And then look at this. Your desire shall be for your husband, and look at the word, he shall what? You notice how all the men said, yeah, rule over. Women didn't say nothing. (laughs) That same Hebrew word, because women, women in the garden sinned, God released this premise or this principle, and we'll talk about this later, not today. Pastor Katana and I are going to do a series on this pretty soon, where the man ends up being here, and the woman is here, okay? And then her desire 
is always to please her husband. I'm not talking about whether you're equal or not equal. I'm just saying a principle that was released because of sin. Okay, and what's deep about the text, I'm not talking about what culture is doing, none of that kind of stuff. There is no command in here that says the woman now will rule over. It says the husband is going to maintain that position, okay, because of sin. And that same word is used when you go to Genesis chapter 4. Jump back to chapter 4 and notice what it says in um, verse 7, and I'm almost done. It says, if you do well, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do well, sin is crouching at your door. Its desire is for you. But notice what it says, you must rule over it. And what I like about the text, what I like about the text is that it says this. When you open the door, here's what happens. You, you allow sin to come in, and now it rules over you. Here's the illustration that I like to use. It's like you let this thing come in, and then you find your state in a constant state of running. Come on, because it's not easy to reverse it, and you take back position. It has you. So here's what it's looked like. God, I can't put you first, because I got all all this stuff going on, and we find ourselves in this crazy debt, and we say, God, I do want to put you first, but now watch this. It's ruling over. It's ruling over. It's ruling over, and the more it rules, the further away we get. Oh, come on, y'all. At least there's truth, preacher. And so here's the depth of this. I love the Mesopotamian example because it says there's a good demon and there's a bad demon. I mean, I'm not pressing the demon issue, but, but here's the, the, when we do right, here's what happened. God stands at the door because he's what? He's first and he's there. The further we push him back, the more access we give the enemy to the front door. Here's the depth, though. And because we're at the front door sleeping with the enemy, the less likely we are to hear God say from a distance, don't do it, because he's so far. Oh, come on, come on. And we can't recognize his voice, but man, we recognize the voice of the people who are ruling at the door. They call and we respond. But here God is way, way in the deck because like I said with the illustration earlier, we have moved so far away that we can't recognize his voice when he is calling. And so we have this situation. We open a door, sin comes in, and it rules. It rules. And it's over us. And what I love about that verse, it says, but you now must master it. Here's what that means. I love this because it's not saying you're stuck. Oh. It's, not, it's not saying this is God's design. It's not saying this is God's intent. Here's what it says. You must rule. Oh, I wish I had two or three people that would say amen. Yeah. So, so here's what he here's what he said. Here's what he said. Here's what he said. I know right now it looks bad. I know you opened the door. I know you let him in. But remember, I am a God that will leave the garden and come to where you are. So even though it's over you, I am under you, holding you up, and I will strengthen you to do this. Ah. Ah. And I will teach you how to maintain a posture of rulership. Last I checked, Peter still says, resist the devil and he will do what? Flee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Y'all know, y'all know, y'all know. Y'all know. And, and, and here's the thing. If, if he's ruling over you, maybe we haven't resisted enough yet. Come on. Maybe we haven't allowed God to come in and turn it around for us. Turn it against the neighbor. You've got the power. Come on, say it again. Say, you've got the power to turn it around. Come on, tell the other neighbor. Say, you've got the power to turn it around. Come on, say, I have the power to turn it around. So here's what you're saying. I right, preach. I'm done. I'm done. One more thing. One more thing. I right, preach. How do I turn it around? Right? How do I flip the script 
Because I don't like being ruled. Is it just me? Come on, come on. Go to Malachi. Go to Malachi. And let's, let's we're going to stop here. Malachi chapter 3. You've heard this scripture over and over again. Matter of fact, you got it memorized during offering time. I want to see if we can do a little bit of justice with it contextually. Say amen if you're there. Give me a handkerchief. Yeah. Say amen if you're there. Look what it says in, um, let me give you context before you read. A little bit of literary context before you read. Here's what's happening. We're at the last book of the Old Testament, and go here with me. In Genesis chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3, it started out with Adam and Eve in the garden right next to God. Chapter 3 happens, they find themselves outside the garden, but still have access to God. Chapter 4 happens, and they're further away, but they still have access to God. Understand with me now, at the time of this text, as we're looking... As we're looking at the text that's in front of us, we are in Malachi. Y'all say Malachi. Let me tell you how far they are. They are here in children's ministry. I'm not saying the children are far from God. Don't hear that. But, but see the distance. See the distance, right? So understand with me, at this stage, God, imagine how far down the line he is on the provision list. <laughs> Because they have strayed. By this time, the northern and southern kingdom has, declared, has happened. They've been divided. They've been in captivity. All kinds of stuff had happened. And it's as if God does not even exist in their framework or in their time anymore. And they're suffering the consequences of their actions, right? So lock into this. So now they're praying. The temple is destroyed. The temple is decimated. I mean, priests are just doing it. It's just crazy, crazy, crazy. But lock into What I love about the text is that when you look at the text, Regardless of where they find themselves, God is still there. So they're praying, God help, God help, God help. We're tired of being ruled over. And so notice what verse 6 says. For I, the Lord, do not change. Somebody say amen for that. Come on, say amen for that. Here, here's what quick, 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 quick point on I, the Lord, do not change. I'm going to treat you all the same way I treated Cain and Abel. I don't change, right? <laughs> I, I took care of Abel, and I had to deal with Cain. I'm going to treat y'all the same way. Don't think that because you're way down there, I'm going to allow certain things to happen because you're in 2018. <laughs> I, the Lord, don't change, okay? If, if I grace them, I, and I love this because I graced Cain and Abel, I graced Adam and Eve, and even though I should have killed them, I didn't kill them. I let them live. And the reason you're living today is because I let you live because I'm a gracious God. I don't change. Come on, come on, say he's gracious. And so look at this. All you children of Israel, of Jacob, you're not consumed. That's what he's saying. For the days of your father, you have turned aside from my statues and have not kept them. Y'all keep lowering me down the provision list. And here's what he says. Here's how we're going to fix this. Return to me, and I will return to you, Lord Jesus. If you do what's right, will you not be accepted? Do what's right, and I'll lift you up. I'll forgive you. I'll grace you. And look into this. Look into this. Says the Lord of hosts. But you say, okay, God, we do want to come back. I'm tired of being ruled. How do I flip the script, right? And then here's what he says. Verse 8, will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. And just like the majority of us today in here are saying, okay, God, how have we robbed you? Come on, you got a bank account that I wish I had. How did we rob you? And here's what he says. In your tithes, my translation says contributions or offerings. And verse 9 says, you are cursed with a curse because you're robbing me. And there's like a little ebonic phrase right here. 
that says, all y'all. Yeah. <laughs> that's what it says. So that's what the whole nation of you means, all y'all. Amen. Preachers and all. Right? So, so lock into this. In your tithes and your contributions, hold up, God. What are you saying? What are you saying? What are you saying? You're saying you guys are stuck doing the Cain thing. You're taking care of you and the local providers, and I'm down the list somewhere. And if I'm not first, something's wrong with this picture. I'm almost there. So here's what he says. Bring the full tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And I love this phrase. And put me to the test, said the Lord of hosts, to see if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. Oh my gosh, I like that. Well, let me read 11, then I'm on. I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not tear up your washing machine anymore. Y'all didn't see that in there? It's right there. All right? So it will not destroy the fruits of your soil. And your vine in the field shall not fail to bear fruit, says the Lord of hosts. Then all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a land of delight, said the Lord of hosts. Let me illustrate this, and I'm done. Say a couple of things. So here's what he's saying. Hey, Cain, hey, Cain, hey, Cain, put me first. You see, you see how Abel over here popping out them sheep, pop, pop, pop. I mean, they just like popcorn. He can't keep them in there. That's what he's saying. If you put me first, the thing that's stopping your vine from producing, you don't have to deal with it. I got you. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. You're being ruled over, and you're trying to fight the demons. Boy, you ain't that strong to deal with no demons. Put me first. Let me... I I got the demons, and if I got them, it's going to naturally, baby, do this. Because if I'm for you, I am more than the world against you. Are oh, you hear me? I will rebuke the devourer. And a lot of us have been fighting with addictions and strongholds and sicknesses and all kinds of stuff. And the problem is we've been trying to fight it by ourselves. Put God where he belongs. Let him handle the enemy. Come on, are you with me? Put him back at the door. Because here's how he's going to do it. He'll close the door first. And I say, I dare any demon in hell to get past me, to go in. Come on, y'all. Come on, y'all. And if you know anything about God, he is stand by the door, and while he's still at the door, he'll go in the house, because that's the kind of God that he is, and deal with the stuff in the house and the door at the same time to begin the process of reversing the curse. Here's what it means. I have to return to him. Got to put him first. Quiet time, right? Men were talking about this. Spend time with him. So, so here, here's what I want you to hear me say. God, I keep you first, not with motives. So here's this. I'm tired of being broke, so I'm going to start tithing. You're going to still be broke. Because <laughs> your attitude ain't right. You kind of get what I'm saying? Are you with me? Remember I said, no manipulation, no $100 line, no $50 line. No, I'm going to start sowing seeds of faith so I can turn this around. Stop the foolishness. I'm going to do it, God. Hey, because it's you. And I just love you. Thank you. Out of gratitude because I love him. I've been married for 36 years. Every time I try to do something for Pastor K, so I can give some, I said something. Yeah. 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 
Y'all just wrong. Amen. It never works. Never works. But whenever I just grab them feet and I get to rubbing, come on, y'all. Because I love her, Shonda. Yeah. God wants the same thing. He don't want us to manipulate our way to his heart. He's not that kind of God. Because I love him. Because of what he did for me. Heck, because of who you are. Because of who he is. And if I can love him like that, no demon can get past my door. No demon is crouching, waiting. Come on, are you hearing me? To enter because God has got me. So my attitude of giving, it ought to be one of gratitude. God, because I love you. And I'm going to begin to put you first because I love you. And because you love me. You show up when I fail you. You show up when I blow it. And for that, God, I love you. That's my prayer. That's my mindset. Is we get to that place where it's all about him. So here's what I want to do. And we're done. Here's what I want to do this morning. Bow your heads wherever you are. Just bow them. Just bow them. Just bow them. Wherever you are. And here's what we're saying. God, forgive me. I'm saying the same thing. Lord, forgive me. Thank you for the reminder, God, of who you are. I repent for manipulation. I repent for all of that. So take a moment with your head bowed and your eye closed and just say, God, just work on me. How far have we strayed? How far away have we gone from the true provider? Bring us back, God. Bring us back, God. And then if you're here and you don't know us, the Lord is your personal Lord and Savior, I want to tell you that he died to save the lost. And you can have access to him. So if you came this morning and you don't know him as Lord and Savior, he's saying, listen, put me first. Put me in your life and watch what I'll do for you. Turn things around. Turn things around. It's the kind of God we serve. So go to him. Go to him. Thank him for the second chances. Thank him for the third chances. Thank him for the many opportunities that he's given us. Your breath in my lungs. So we pour out your praise. Pour out your praise. It's your breath in my lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only, Lord. Great are you, Lord. God, we thank you for this word. Thank you for what you're teaching, God. Thank you for what we're learning. Worship you in spirit and in truth. Not to get. It's manipulation. But just because of who you are. So we love you like that. We love you like that. Our attitude is going to be different, Lord, as we continue to worship you. Thank you for who you are, God. Please pay attention to our gifts. Whatever they may be, be them financial, be them our spiritual gifts, be them our bodies, be them our service, whatever they may be, God, be pleased. We love you like that. Forgive us, forgive us, forgive us. And thank you for second chances. In your name, amen. Come on, give God a hand, praise.